there's four modules, right? We arbitrarily created, uh, and as we get go through these, we will kind of maybe work on exactly how all the modules will fit together. But the idea is to have a very um, high level overview one at the beginning, and then three more modules where we can dig into cybersecurity, into risk management, and 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 the kind of privacy by design, how to put all these things into practice. So this is the high level one. I hope that is uh, at the right level for you both, right? Um, we should have plenty of time to, to get into any specific details as either we go along. I think you could wave your hand if you wanted to ask a question. I think that's perfectly fine, right? Uh, I'm not working to a script, so we can just pause at any time and say, what does that actually mean? Super good, or we can leave them to the end, right? If there's no questions, it's fine, no pressure. All right, so um, this is what we're gonna cover, right? We're here because there are some laws, right? <laughs> Those laws actually can be divided into a neat set of principles right, and some lawful basis. So we will go through those um, because they're extremely useful. We will mention several terms. We will mention consent, we'll mention harm, right? And we'll all end up at accountability, right? Um, review privacy by design. We'll go through why I believe that the risk-based approach is way better than trying to become compliant. And then we'll just review the policy set to make it clear that it's not ginormous. <laughs> it's a, a very practical thing to become, um, you know, compliant with, with the acts. So the three laws you need to know about. Um, there are more laws you need to know about, as especially as medical tech startups, there are clinical safety, there's all kinds of things you need to be compliant with. Um, but these are the three inside the privacy domain, right? And we often talk about GDPR and we just group it under that. Uh, but, but probably privacy is what we should be saying. It's just a, a more good collective. So the Data Protection Act 2018, there has been a Data Protection Act you know, for decades in the UK. The 2018 one brings in the GDPR, it sets up the regulator, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. It tailors the GDPR for the UK. So a small example of that would be it's 16 in Europe to sign up for YouTube, but it's 13 in the UK. Right, so it makes some small adjustments, and it excludes some government agencies, secrecy stuff, right? Um, and that's true for all European countries. So the EU GDPR is a EU regulation, and when it, when a thing is a regulation, it means that EU countries are required to find, then adopt it into law, right? And so all countries will then have their own like Data Protection Act or whatever they like to call it, and then they can do their own tailoring, right? Um, the government always asks us to read them alongside. Right. So they say, you know, it's, it's not a question of saying, well, we just have to read the data protection. Act. Nope. They say, read it alongside. And that basically means you will find one or two small alterations or differences or additional things on the EU side, uh, as well as the DP, DPA side. So um, that's life. I wish it was one, but it ain't. Right. Um, and then finally, the PECR, the Privacy and Electronic uh, Communications Regulation. So that is uh, actually initially set up for ISPs or telephony companies or other network companies and it's meant to sort of um, control them or uh, regulate them but it actually contains um, principally the fact that if you want to put a cookie which is a piece of data onto somebody else's computer you need permission to do that right and it's a when you think about that of course <laughs> get your hands off my computer right and yet that is what a cookie is it, it's just putting something onto somebody else's personal property um, and also covers direct marketing so those are the the three laws and that's all we'll be discussing today that's the scope so can i just ask a question sorry yes, of on that. um so obviously because the uk left the eu um so and i guess they have a they've now copy and pasted that into uk legislation i guess but did they introduce any changes so is there a uk gdpr that's slightly different or not the uk gdpr is pretty much identical to the EU GDPR, except for the minor alterations, like things like, say, for example, the date of the the, the age of of of, of uh, children for consent. So basically, that's it. There's, there's almost nothing else different. Uh, okay. Yes, if you if you can, I mean, the government would like to change the direction of travel, so they've already they've already put a bill in front of Parliament, um, which would essentially um, radically right change the approach from compliance. There, you will have a data protection officer. They will they will audit you, and you will say yes, I'm compliant. To uh, privacy management program, 
that's what the way they've said it is. And they said, yes, we'll get rid of the whole data protection officer idea. We'll, we'll then have something else. A lot of people obviously are saying that's incredibly worrying because it basically means you're saying that if I, if I have both British and European customers, then I have to have two different regulations because here's the thing, and, and, and this screen actually answers some of your questions. Um, the Data Protection Act is a British re regulation and it applies to anybody that processes individuals' data, not in a personal way. So if you are an individual, a sole trader, and you've decided to keep an address book of customers, that's all it, that's all it takes for the Data Protection Act to, to apply. If you are a sole trader and you put a camera outside your office, your business, again, Data Protection Act applies. It just doesn't apply if you are running a wedding list, right? Or, you know, have a, your own private uh, address book. It's not, it's not for private processing, but an organization or an individual processing any data, Data Protection Act applies. Right, the Data Protection Act that then basically says and the GDPR, right? So one one way or the other, they get all the GDPR text into the DPA. The EU GDPR applies specifically if you are processing the data of EU residents, not even EU citizens, but someone who is in the EU right now. So they could be an American working in the EU for three months, right, at a bank, and at that point, the EU applies uh, GDPR applies to them, right? I can see some spelling. Spelling check has kicked in here, and I can see a few typos. Apologies. Um, it wouldn't apply if you exclude, right, people. Now, this is a classic case of, say, as a as a person living in Britain, and I go to to browse an American site. It's less often now, but for a long period of time, I would just be blocked. They would say, "I'm sorry, I can't serve you this data," right? And the reason is that they're not able to be at that time compliant with the EU GDPR, and here I am in the EU, right? Um, and it also means that they don't intend to be compliant because they intend to capture a cookie and they intend to mark it based on that data. And that is perfectly acceptable in America, but just not acceptable in Europe. So ways to get around that are to geofence. So you can simply say, yes, I don't accept anybody who's <clears throat> in Europe, right? Or if you just don't make an offer to Europeans, right? And how the EU regulators would see that is if you price in euros. If you price in euros, you're making an offer to Europeans, at which point the EU GDPR would apply. If you don't offer delivery to Europe and you only price in dollars, right? American e-commerce companies are therefore excluded. They don't have to make an explicit act about that. It's just that they don't say they say we don't deliver to Europe, right? So you'd have to you'd have to invent some mechanism and this we don't deliver in EU um, currency. So um, and then PCR, yes, if you want to store a cookie, it does apply. The GDPR also has cookie section, and if you want to mark it via emails or text then it also applies. And then I threw this last one in, I thought no one it won't apply to anybody, but in, technically it does. It applied to anybody who wanted to compile a directory, e.g. the Health Foundry, right? So if the Health Foundry wanted to compile a public ad a directory of information, then that would also weirdly be covered by the PECR. So they apply to you, basically. <laughs> and what do they require? What do the laws want? Well, all laws want to be followed for sure, Right, but they're good laws and they want to do something else. And that is what they want to make sure that you are doing lawful processing, right, of data. You cannot process data for a living individual, identifiable, unless you have a legal reason to do so. So it basically says illegal unless, right? Um, and two, that you're accountable. So all three pieces of legislation are attempting to reduce the harm to individuals caused by the processing of their data. And to achieve this, they insist that you have a lawful reason to process someone's data and that you take accountability for processing, right? And that includes, and this is you know, where, where, the, where my role comes in, um, the ability to demonstrate your compliance. Now, a little sidebar here. I am not a long-term data protection officer. I actually come from an IT director background. I was the director of IT at the National Theatre. I was the director of IT at the V&A Museum. I was the director of IT at Cancer Research UK. So I have a, a 25, nearly 30 year career as an IT director. And the key role there is managing risks and assuring senior stakeholders, including the board, that we're on top of those risks, which is why I bring that um, to my new consultancy, which is let's not do this by the letter. Let's do this by the spirit and make sure we understand um, the risks we have. So if, if you take one thing away from today, it is that the government is not protecting individuals from harm, you are. And it will be on you if you allow something to happen that you could have prevented 
had you demonstrably taken accountability. Yes, that's the, the, the word accountable will come up again. Okay, so we said there were seven principles and we said there were six lawful basis. So we'll just go through these seven principles. I think they're great. Uh, you know, they're not the only way to, to, to go about creating law. Many laws are quite prescriptive. Uh, but in the case of the Data Protection Act, I think this is a fantastic way of saying if you were to if you were to embed these in your business, it'd be hard for you to to create harm, right? If if you if you truly follow these, a bit of a uh, you know a, a, a Scotsman fallacy. But let's see. Right, first one: lawfulness, fairness, fairness and transparency. Right, as we say, you must have a lawful business, uh, lawful basis for processing data, and you must process it fairly and transparently. OK, that's it's straight up. Right. I mean, and, and when you hear about data breaches, it is because they either do something illegal. Right. They don't have permission to process your data. Right. Uh, TikTok recently, but there's many organizations that are coming a crop up with this. It's like we're, we're going to see a big wave now. You know, you think the GDPR has been for a while. Yes, it has. But that's not how the law works. It takes a while for these things to become cases. So we're starting to see large corporate organizations being found guilty right, of unlawful processing of data. Um, transparently, always let them know what you're doing. And fairly, again, if I'm going to use your data, it shouldn't cause you harm, okay? So that's the first principle. Second principle, purpose limitation, right? If you're going to process data, only for the purpose you said, right? Not process in a way that's incompatible with that purpose. I'll give an example of that. There was a hospital, right? Uh, and they wanted to bring a, uh, a disciplinary against a doctor, and they realized that the doctor was also a, a, a patient at the hospital. So they accessed the patient record and found that the person had a drug dependency, and they used that in the disciplinary. Wow, okay, that is not allowed. <laughs> the purpose of that data was to help that person uh, get better, right? That's the reason he, he gave that data to the hospital, is as a patient not to be accessed by somebody else for the purposes of HR management. Um, so that's a good example of that, you know, we, we only do what we say we're going to do with the data we captured. We can't then say, what else can we do with this? Data minimization, one of my favorites, right? If you don't have the data, you can't lose the data. If I don't keep it, I can't lose it. If I don't capture it from you, right? I can't accidentally share it with somebody else. So data minimization says, what is the minimum data that I need from you to deliver the service? Do I really need to even know who you are? Could you be completely anonymous? Could you sign up using an anonymous system that we help create for you? Well, it's tricky because in the end, we're going to need to communicate you with something like an email or a phone number or something. But as a principle, instead of saying, right, we're a business, we better start collecting stuff, right? Uh, let's have a think about that. There's another example I gave in another talk where if you think of yourself as being, say, somebody who is going to store keys for the, the local neighborhood so that if they go on holiday, there's a copy of the key with you and not under the map. And that way, if they lose their keys when they're abroad or if someone needs to get into the house, there's a system whereby they can do that. So I'm a business. So a business is capture names and addresses, right? So naturally, as a business, I'm just going to capture your name and address. But here's the thing. Imagine I was broken into and I've got all these keys and there's also a name, a list of names and addresses. It's the worst possible outcome. The thief now has the keys and the names and addresses. So do I need the name? Best not to have the name and address when I'm storing it with a key. And if I can find a way of, of not requiring that, I've created a much safer business, right? By just not following the kind of like common sense of saying, well, clearly I need a database, clearly I need a CRM, and it should have your details in it, right? Because we've identified a risk that the more we capture, blah, blah, blah. So data minimization as a principle should be right at the front. What is the minimum we need to capture in order to do the job? Um, accuracy, obviously, especially in the mental health and health uh, charities, it, or any, any health data, if the data is wrong, the diagnosis is as likely to be wrong. So how could that happen? Well, you might copy the data. You might move the data. You might migrate the data. You might upgrade the database. You might merge the database, right? You know, there's lots, there's lots of reasons how the data became wrong, right? Um, so it's entirely your accountability to, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Storage limitation, 
similar to minimization. Get rid of it the minute you don't need it. Right now, a lot of people say, oh, can I, how long can I keep it? And I'm going, that's not a question. <laughs> you can keep it forever. Look at, for example, say pension data, right? Stored by the organization that has your pension until you're dead, right? Uh, I'm sure there's other data that might even last past your death. So, so there's no absolute legal limit as to how long you can store data. That's not the question. The question is, as long as I have it, I could breach. And as long as that breach could cause damage to my organization, I don't want it. So I should have a process for getting rid of it as soon as I can. Integrity and confidentiality. Um, this is the one that basically brings cybersecurity into the conversation. This is the one that says, uh, you know, in order to keep all of this data secure, you better have some processes to, to, to do that. And so when people often say, ah, cybersecurity is not the same as data protection, it's true, absolutely. Privacy is not the same as cybersecurity. But in actual fact, the regulation casually <laughs> brings it in and says, you better also have some cybersecurity while you go about it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's in the mix. And finally, but perhaps most importantly, accountability, right? That is what the ICO is going to expect from you. And 90% and of the problems will occur when you've had a breach and somebody complains. Right? They say, I don't believe, I, I told you to delete the data and you didn't delete it. And how do I know this? Because you just marketed to me again. Right? I told you to delete it because how do I know? Because you just marketed to my dead mother. Right? Um, and I've complained to the ICO. And this is where the ICO comes and says, right, let's have a look and see what you've done. If you have taken accountability, you will have all the processes, you will have the documentation, and they will go, well, oh, this looks fine. So it's just a mistake. And you go, yes, it was a mistake and we've got a process for rectifying it. Um, and they'll go, fine. Right? If, you, if they turn up and find that you've never taken accountability, <laughs> uh, have I accidentally muted? We're still good. Can everybody still hear me? Yep. Okay, fine. Uh, sorry, I've got a little thing that just booped at me. Um, so accountability is super important. If you take accountability, honestly, the ICO will find it hard to to find fault with the efforts you have made and when you look at when I look, I look through the fines that they're constantly producing and it's usually people who've just not engaged so accountability equals engagement with the fact that there are laws and you've taken reasonable steps to to meet them so quick summary again seven principles of data protection right as set by the law and repeated by the ICO lawfulness purpose limitation data minimization accuracy storage limitation, length of time, integrity and confidentiality, and accountability. So when we go through the process of, of developing our, our policies, right, our practices, our processes, our, our leadership, we will be thinking about these seven principles. We might you know, occasionally have a workshop just on one. You could say, I'd like to go through all of our data for the purposes of storage limitation. And that's what you would do when you create a records management policy with retention policies for each type of data. You're, you're putting storage limitation into practice, okay? Lawful basis. We've said it many times so far in this short presentation. What, what does it mean, lawful basis? It's the absolute essence. You cannot process data unless you have a lawful basis to do so. And the, the, the Data Protection Act has provided us with six, okay? So we're now going to go through these six and see what they are, okay? First off, consent widely regarded as the gold standard. If you have consent, you can now do the thing you said with the data and no one can say otherwise, right? Even if that was weird, <laughs> right? Even if that seemed eccentric, even if that seemed counter to, you know, whatever you can imagine, well, why would, why would, because I've consented. I've said, do that to my data, right? So it's the gold standard, but, and we'll discuss in a bit, it can be withdrawn, right? Um, so what if you needed another reason? So even the ICO makes it clear, consent is not the only reason. And when someone says, oh, I need to have consent, the answer is no, you don't. There are other lawful bases. One is contractual necessity, super common. If I'm gonna contract with you, I need to store some, some information about you, even if you don't like that idea. If you want to contract with me, you have to give me your name, and your address to deliver the goods, your phone number so that I can follow up if you're not there, um, an email address to send the bill to, right? A bank account, to receive a payment from, et cetera, right? So contractual uh, is, a, is super common. Now, there are small caveats. 
Um, some lawyers would say a contract's not a contract until a pound has been exchanged, right? There needs to be a financial element of contract. Um, but I think it's it's often enough to say, okay, we're not for profit, and we're not charging for the service, but we still have asked you to sign any terms and conditions. We've asked you to sign acceptance of that, and we consider that to be a contract and therefore binding, and that's the reason we're storing information. Legal obligation. Uh, a little bit for you guys uh, in the sense that you have employees. If you have employees, you have a legal obligation to store some information about them that's quite personal and process that with, for example, HMRC. So that's the legal obligation, right? So there occasionally you are required some types of medicines might or to being a doctor or uh, firearm sales in America, right? There will be legal obligations. I must capture something about you, your some NI number or something, right? Um, it's not that common, right? As I say, but for specific things, it's just always there. Um, vital interests, unless you are in the emergency health, extremely unlikely. Vital interest means life or death. Um, so, for example, a ambulance could go through your wallet, take some information out of that wallet, put it into a handheld computer in order that the hospital receives the data about um, the fact your, your blood condition or your blood type or, or something else they, they measured in the ambulance. Okay, as I say, unless your emergency health, uh, it's not going to apply. And I've put this little thing below there. You can't for health data. It can't be relied on if the person can consent. So it kind of it's implicit in there that the person is unconscious or unable to cons to consent at that time. Public task, again, unlikely for you guys, but this is where uh, the, somebody has been granted authority. For example, of uh, lo local authority voting records, local authority tax records. Okay, so that's a public task, um, and uh, it's required that some information is is captured about that. So that's enough of a reason. Local authority doesn't need another reason to store your voting record. So it comes to the catch-all, legitimate interests. If you haven't found, <laughs> if you haven't found one in the above five, there is always legitimate interests. And people think of it as a kind of a, a, a right, that'll hoover it up. It actually comes with some um, some requirements. So if, for example, we have a contract, I don't need to write anything down. I mean, I will write down, I'm gonna store your name and address, and I'm going to put next in my record of processing activities that, that that's for contract. And no one will think that, that's all I need to say. I have a contract with you, you signed it, and so therefore I have the right to store information about it. Just enough, no more but that. Legitimate interest requires you to document why you believe you have a legitimate interest. To store data without consent, without a legal obligation, without a public task, right? Without a contract. Let me give an example. Say I am a political party and I am canvassing at, at the doorstep. I come round to my house and the political party says, hi, John, can we rely on your vote at the next election? And I say, no, you can't, and please never come here again, right? And they say, well, could I store that? I say, no, you can store nothing about me. I do not consent. Um, they don't need my consent. Why? Because that political party can write down that they have a legitimate interest to not come to my house again, right? It's a waste of their time. It's a waste of their money to market to me. It's a waste of their money to send me, um, you know, um, brochures or, 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 or marketing information or, or invite me to events. It's a waste of their time, right? And that they have a public duty as a party to try to not waste the limited cash they have to advance democracy. So they have kept a record of me in their database saying I am not a voter. And here's the thing. That is special category data. A person's political views fall under a special category, right? Uh, which we're not going to get into today. Um, but but it just basically means it's it's, a, it's it includes health, political views, um, certain specific things that that the organ that the government regards as needs extra care, right? Needs this extra reason, right? Um, legitimate interest is there and allows a political party to store my political beliefs in a database forever. Right, um, and you'll find, for example, if you go to the Labour Party's website, they've got their legitimate interest register available publicly. Um, this is why we're going to store data. This is the risks we believe are there. This is the the the, the actions we're going to take to 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 keep that data confidential. So lawful basis, there are six. You can pick any of them. They're not in any particular order. There's no hierarchy. And it's just one of your jobs to figure out which of these is going to be the best with regards to the data type, 
with regards to interaction you're going to have with your customers and so on. So consent, we mentioned consent, right? As I say, it's not the only, um, it's not the only thing you can use. Um, in fact, it might arguably not even be the most recommended, um, but it's there. And for certain types of thing, it's required. One very specific thing, all marketing. <laughs> all marketing requires consent, right? Um, that is the, that's, that's built in, that's hard. So what does consent look like? Well, it's informed, right? There's going to be transparency. It has to be easy to do, right? And it be, must be capable of being withdrawn at any time, right? It mustn't be a requirement. So if a person um, wants to sign up your service but doesn't want to take marketing, you can't demand that. You can only demand what's required to carry out the service, right? Which might be very little. You can't say, now can I have your children's date of birth as well? Because, you know, I quite fancy sending them a Brusty card. No, that's not required for me to, to be a donor to your charity. Right, um, I will consent as to whether that information is going, and, and later on I can withdraw it. And it must be very easy to withdraw. And you see all these bad examples online occasionally of well, you, to, to withdraw consent you have to write to us <laughs> in a letter, right, to America, right? That is that's that would fail, right? It, click the button. As easy as I click the consent, must be as easy to withdraw the consent. So consent, very important part of EU legislation, very important part of the whole concept of privacy not the only thing to do but it, when you are relying on it it has to be for real you can't say oh i got consent but in actual fact you bundle it all up under one consent and they've accidentally agreed to marketing as well as um delivery of the product what is harm talk about harm right it's a critical part of the of the of the of the lexicon and harm can be almost anything you can think of and i've put a few things here just to get to spark the ideas, um, but a very important part of your risk management when you come to do it will be putting yourself in the in the in the in the in the, in the shoes of one of your customers and saying, what would I feel like if this information was to get out? What could happen? Let's give an example, right? Uh, a doctor's surgery. Um, there's a reception area. The receptionist has a nice big screen with a nice big calendar of all of the people who are going to turn up. And that's visible to the people standing at the counter. So at this point, you now have a data breach because it's possible for a neighbor or partner to see that a person, right, that they know, right, is getting an appointment with the gynecologist or the oncologist, right? So you have just revealed data right, that a person is attending a medical appointment. And that could be tremendously harmful to them, right? Um, that, that's something they, it's, it's their choice. The, the interesting thing about data is, or personal information is, it's yours. It's, it's, it's mine. I decide when it gets revealed and how it gets revealed. And it's very important for organizations that are doing processing to just basically re remember that it's, you're, you're taking custody, right, um, of somebody else's data. Uh, and it's, it's, up to them if they feel that it's harmful. So you have to do this. You can't just simply say, well, it just names an address. Yeah, but what if it's a mental health charity right, that, they're, that they're contacting or, a, or, a, or an alcohol you know, abuse clinic? So it's just a name and address. It seems harmless, but it also is associated with who they're visiting um, and they may not want people to know that. And that's on them to decide that. So as you can see, harm, all kinds of um, places where that might uh, Come up, and, it, and, it, and, and you have to be creative when you think about it, right? Um, so accountability, right? We understand now there is way more in the Data Protection Act than I have just, right? All kinds of things that we've not touched on today, but those are the principles and those are the lawful basis, and that's your start, right? And so what is accountability? What's the statement of intent? You're going to need a policy that says, all right, all right, we're going to be compliant. Right, so it could be a data protection policy, it could be an information policy, it could be information security policy, it really doesn't matter. As long as it's a policy at the top of the tree <clears throat> that says we've got these other policies, we've got this is who's in charge, right? Appoint somebody at the board, that's good practice, right? Um, someone who will, 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 will offer once a year, twice a year to, to receive a presentation from, from, from you and say, this sounds good, because it is in fact a board level accountability, a bit like anti-slavery and so forth. A senior manager with the area of responsibility, very important. Nothing will happen in your organization if it is not led, right? People will just fall back, fall back onto 
easier practice, right? Um, especially if you've made it hard to be a good privacy citizen, if you made it hard to do people's work in a way that in, encourages them or enables them, then they will adopt other practices. They'll start sharing files. They'll start downloading spreadsheets. They'll start sharing the spreadsheets in a file. They'll, they'll take that home. They'll put it on their home system. They'll send it to their own Gmail because you've made it hard to work. So uh, having someone in charge of the concept of privacy and how everybody will have to participate in that um, is vital to, um, to, to ensuring that things actually get done, right? Um, we often say that essentially it, it might take a whole quarter, maybe two quarters of the CEO saying, this is what I'm doing for this quarter. I'm going to ensure that that um, everybody understands that this is a there's no option on this, right? Um, so two, we're going to record our actions to achieve compliance. We're going to have policies. Policies are nothing without processes. This is one of my bugbears. You can have a policy to say that we shall, and then nobody does anything about it, right? We shall. It's like so hopeful, <laughs> right? So this is where we need to say. Uh, we shall do these things and we shall have the following processes. They can be checklists, classic. Um, you, they can use some system you have at work. Either way, they're processes in the diary. Once a month, we shall X. Once a week, we shall Y. Once a year, we shall, you know, keeping everything regular. And contracts. Now, contracts, very important. One last thing I'm putting in here, I'm not going to discuss it in depth because other modules, but in taking accountability, you are also deciding that you are the data controller. Right, either the data controller or the data processor, processor. The data controller is the person or organization making the decisions about what data to collect, why to collect it, what to do with it. The person who makes those decisions is the data controller under law. You've got somebody entering, Freya. Hello, Freya. We're, we're considerably we're considerably down the the list of things to to talk about, but just we'll, we'll, we will there'll be Q and A afterwards and anything that jumps out. So we were just literally saying that the, the data controller is another term that we use. Um, it is related to the concept of accountability, right? Um, and to be the data controller is to be, in the eyes of the law, the person making the decisions, right? So even if you um, said that somebody else will do my processing, mm -mm -mm, the data controller will always keep that accountability. Right? I mean, the data process processor themselves also has accountability, but here's the thing. The data processor only has to be uh, accountable to the law, right? You are re responsible if you tell them to do something, right, with that data uh, that you should not have done, right? Providing they stick, stay within the law, they can't be held accountable for um, breaches, right? So if they are secure, blah, 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 if they follow your instructions, et cetera, et cetera. So the data controller is is part of that whole um, accountability concept. Okay, where are we now? We talked about privacy by design, right? Um, the ICO and the other agencies, they put it right up front. You should be thinking about this whole thing as privacy by design. They've actually just recently changed the name of this now to data protection by default. <laughs> I think that's worse than privacy by design. So. I'm hanging on to privacy by design for as long as I can. I just think it's a, a neater term. And anyway, privacy is more than just data protection. Um, and I think that um, by calling it privacy, we, we, we keep that in the mix. So what does that mean, right? Um, privacy by design is a decision by the organization that as a digital app or service um, creators, we will put, put privacy, put Data Protection Act, into our whole process of existence. What we will not do is say, right, I've designed an app, now, now is it, is it secure, <laughs> right? What are we finding? What am I, oh, it's not very secure, ah, oh, shit. We'll have, to, we'll have to add something on, we need to tack on some, so what can we do to fix that? No, no, no. Let us start right at the beginning and saying that we will lead on privacy as our organizations and we will not react later, right? We'll be proactive, not reactive. Um, we'll do it first, we won't try and remediate it. OK, um, the government is keen to see privacy by default. Right. So this is their new tagline. And what they mean by that is quite interesting, which is that the user doesn't have to interact with the system in order for it to maximize their data protection stance. 
right? So in other words, it shouldn't be that by default, right, it is share my data with any other third parties. Share my data with any of our subgroup of companies, right? Um, keep my data forever. Uh, you can do whatever you like with my data, right? And that shouldn't be the default. Instead, the, de the default should be we will never share. It's set. So imagine you go into like uh, websites these days or cookie panels, all these kind of things, and you have a few settings. And often those settings are essentially all on. And you're going to have to turn them off. And the government is saying, please don't do that. So if that resulted in a data breach or a complaint, they'd be saying, well, it should automatically set up the user's interaction with the app or the website to think about privacy first. Think about your bank. Your banks are going to say, listen, do you want any protection? <laughs> do you want a password? No, no, no. The bank is saying that no, we start with maximum protection. And then perhaps later on, we could say, uh, do you want to use biometrics to rapidly open your account rather than going through all the rigmarole? Well, we'll start with the rigmarole. OK. Um, the design process. Right. So you have a design team. Right. Um, Scrum, Agile. Right. All that kind of thing. Where is privacy inside that process? So as we create a new feature, how do we think about privacy? So in other words, your actual design processes should have the word right in there as part of either the checklists or the, or the life cycle, or whatever. Right? Positive sum, not zero sum. Right? Positive sum is an approach to eliminating the concept of trade-offs. So your developers say, hey, well, you think we can't do that. If, if you ask us to be private, we'll have to give up that feature. That's the classic. No, 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 John. If you want, if you want us to do that, well, I have to give that up. That's zero sum, okay? We want to go to a situation where we offer all the functionality with all the privacy. That's your mission, not some other mission that you thought of where you could basically make it easier on yourself by just offering it and eliminating privacy or security um, as part of it. Lifecycle protection, it's not okay just to have good policies when a person arrives in your organization, but what about through, and especially what about the end? Right to the end, that data should be being considered. It's never lost, it's never left behind. We've got some data, it's over there. We don't know what it, what it is. No, no, no. Life cycle means how, how do I know at any one point that a piece of data is in the post customer phase, one year retention, and then gone, right? And even when disposed, disposed where? I mean, you know, the, you know laptops can retain data um, for a long time on hard drives. Um, so disposal. Transparency, we have touched on uh, at all times, your users should know what's going to happen with the data they supply because you respect the fact that it is their data, right? So privacy by design is to place all of these things inside the way you think about how you architect, how you design backends, thinking about documentation, thinking about how you're going to explain things, how are you going to change it? If, if it, you know, how, how are we going to modify it, right? If we make a change, we should go back through and run our risk assessments again. How significant a change, right? Um, I, I often or, or organize companies thinking into the things they mustn't touch, right? If they touch it, they must go through the process. These things over here, they can touch those. They're never going to affect this. There's no connections between this system and that system. These things are free to be manipulated as much as you like. This system over here, okay, anything attached to it, whenever you propose a change, we go through the little thinking, ah, does that affect privacy? Does it affect security? Does it affect... Um, the consent or the, or, the, or the promises we've made to the customer. So you can see why, in general, I'm arguing for a risk approach rather than a compliance approach. I'm asking for a process approach rather than a once. Compliance is basically, what is the minimum that I can do to get someone to say, yep, yeah, you're compliant? And here's the thing, you, you're compliant the minute in that second where the data protection officer says, yeah, I'm signing off and, or, or whatever um, ISO or somebody signing off your process. And then a week later, are you still compliant? A month later, are you still compliant? Getting unlikely unless your processes are perfectly embedded, right? And you can see that compliance is a state of mind, right? It's a state of continuous awareness of the fact that you have decided to process someone's personal data. And to do so is to introduce the concept that there is some possible harm, right? Now, not always. Some of your businesses may only be just storing, you know, I mean, a ticketing business, right? Um, if someone, if it was released that a person had bought a ticket to an event, well, unless it's a fascist event, unless it's a Nazi rally, right? Then, you know, the harm is relatively low. And therefore, your processes should reflect that. 
right? But as we said, even a doctor who's only just storing a name and a time, if it's revealed in public, might be cause someone some harm. So the harm is self-defined. Um, so compliance, it's, it's, not, it's not going to fix the problem when finally you do a release of some data, someone complains, and it's in the press that organization X has released some children's data by accident. I mean, the classic is just sending a file to the wrong gym, not Jim in the design team, who's currently on holiday, right? Not access to the VPN. So you just decide to email him the spreadsheet of the data and you email it to the wrong gym. The other gym is a journalist who you've been trying to sell the idea of a, a marketing splash in the trade mag and that gym receives it. He doesn't really like you. So he just forwards it to the ICU and say, this is bad, right? And there's your breach. There's your reputation. There's your story. Um, and again, how bad that story is, is dependent entirely on the data. Now, most of the people in the foundry are going to be medical data. It's going to be health data, um, all of which are likely to cause enough of a story if they're released. So it won't be the fine of whatever, a few thousand pounds. It will be the reputational loss. So instead, we're going to approach this whole thing as part of standard risk management tactics for any business. Reputation is your key in the future. This screen, we're nearly done. This screen just shows the kind of things we're talking about that you would be putting in place, okay? Um, there are more, right? You could have less. You may have no bring your own device, right? But policies like these, right? Um, only, only one is demanded, and that is the records of processing activities, the ROPA, also known as the Article 30. And that is, again, people go, oh, what's that going to be? I say, it's not, it's easy. It's just a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet that says in a reasonably granular form that you store personal data for HR, you store personal data for pensions, you store personal data uh, of, um, of customers, right? And you store them in Amazon or Xero or you know, Bright HR, um, or you've got this personal database. This is your system. What is the legal basis you store it? How long do you retain it for? Is there any special category data? That's it, right? You can see how it's, it's, not, it's not mega onerous, right? It's just an attitude of mind to make sure that someone's taking responsibility and they've set aside a half a day a month, a day a month to make sure that they understand that no one's added more data sets, <laughs> no one's copied the data uh, someone shouldn't have uh, and so forth. Um, I put in information security, yes, it's not data protection, but yes, I think it's necessary. So that's the end of our talk, right? Quick summary. Uh, there are laws and there is compliance. You know, it's, 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 it's not only about risk, but it's not the law that will hurt your business, but your loss of reputation, okay? And the world is moving towards a slightly more privacy-aware state, right? Um, I mean, you think about even pl places in America, America having a particularly... Uh, um, open regime of uh, it's really do we like that's not true in California anymore so California has adopted the GDPR now, and a lot of places like say I mean I have clients who are currently working in Nigeria uh, they have a new NDPR and it basically says here it is it's a draft it's a work in progress if there's something missing we fall back on the EU GDPR and that is now the, the common stance around the world is the EU GDPR looks like it's well designed it's been running a while Basically, if we don't have a law, that applies. These are the laws, but if you find a gap, go straight to the EU GDPR. That's the direction of travel. The principles are well designed. They're easy to absorb. They make sense. They're coherent, right? Um, if, you, if you work your way through them as you develop your app, um, there's no reason why uh, you won't do well, right? Lawful basis doesn't have to be consent. You have to tell people what it is, and then accountability. Right. Decide that you're going to do data, nominate your leader, design and document and review. Right. And that is the end. Right. So uh, there was only one question in the middle, but I think now is the ideal opportunity for people to say, um, especially Freya, if there's anything that's burning that you came here to learn, um, uh, if, if, if you want to ask that now, now is your ideal. We have eight minutes.
Uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry, um, I had a bit of an emergency this morning, which uh, kept me from joining sooner. Um, but this looks like it would be, it has, has been really um, useful. I do actually have a question around um, data privacy and like data separation and in terms of um, keeping personally identifiable information separate. Um, separate I, from? Separate from? Separate from the rest of the user data. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, in our app, we have, we collect um, user name and email when they log in and we're yep. keeping that in a separate table to the rest of their data and it's linked by an ID. We're now looking at using a completely uh, separate um, system to do the authentication, which uh, should be more, sec um, more secure because it's Google rather than our database provider, which is Xanto. Um, but I was thinking to move the name and email to uh, Firebase under the authentication and then store all of the rest of the user data in Xanto. Um, and obviously it would then just be linked by an ID. And when the user logs in, they're authenticated through Firebase and then um, uh, exchange uh, a secure uh, JWT token to log into to Xano. But I just wondered what your view on in terms of security and um, because obviously also I think um, my colleague called it privacy by ob uh, obscurity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, it's it, it, quite normal. So mm. a preferably normal approach, right? Mm. Um, to create um, of an anonymized data sets later that you can then share, you can analyze, you can allow people to search. Um, the only things to worry about are, mm -hmm. um, when you think about risks, we often think about external risks. Mm -hmm. We say someone might, how could they hack in? And so yeah. in, in security terms, we're thinking about escalating our privilege, right? Mm -hmm. So how could I escalate my privilege to see all the other codes? Because if one set of database, say the data, just imagine that the data containing the references was in public, right? Mm -hmm. and, all, and the data containing the IDs was in private. How would I escalate my privileges on the private data set in order to be able to associate those co codes with the, with the public set? Because the code only mm -hmm. looks anonymous. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. it actually identifies a person uniquely. It's yeah. just that you can't see that. Yeah. If I could get to that data, I would complete the task. Yeah. So yeah. the outside agency might be to, to do that escalation. The most likely risks are going to be internal. So again, when, we, when you would come to do your risk, you do your information map, you create your information model, you define these various things, and now you're going to do your risk assessment, right? You could start to think about internal actors, right? Mm -hmm. Making mistakes, mm -hmm. okay? So when somebody has to do this task, when they move these things around, what could they what could go wrong an error right or malice right mm -hmm. that would reconnect the data sets right um, and if you can find that moment you can identify a risk it might not be possible but it's extremely likely that it's possible right and therefore there's what that yeah. that's where the risk is so the approach is totally fine right i have many customers okay. who are all using data yeah. to share with third parties for analysis right mm -hmm. uh, one other one other caveat one of the gotcha say the data set was small Say there was um, other data in there that, that's related to something knowable. For example, a person's skin color, right? Mm -hmm. And that was in the data. And say there's only one of those. Mm -hmm. and so you knew everybody in the data set and you mm -hmm. knew it, that there was one person whose skin color was X. Yeah. You can now, you can now identify that yeah. person. So yeah. again, I have some customers who do produce anonymized data sets for sharing with things on local authorities. Um, and they have a specific process, a specific heuristic to say that data set's too small. I'm mm -hmm. not sharing the data. They just refuse to yeah. share it. Instead, they'll just share highlights. 77% yeah. do X, 5% yeah. do Y, right? Yeah. It's just that the 5% is one out of 20 people, 20 boys yeah. in a class, and one of them is black, and that's mm -hmm. the boy. And because it says 5% are black, they know it's 20, so they know it's that guy, right? So you've accidentally mm -hmm. breached data. So, mm -hmm. so when, we, when we think about anonymization, there are various, um, you know, there are various risks, right? Yeah. So it doesn't make it perfect. Um, yeah. But that's fine because it was never perfect anyway. 
And the most important thing is that you have your risk map and that mm. you you think about your processes and, and all of the different threat actors, some of whom are just mistakes. It's most likely a mistake, an error that causes the breakdown of your of the of the cool system um, that we've invented. Mm. Hope hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Yeah, so I have a, a question about um, third parties, yeah. where if I'm the the data controller um, for certain personal data, and um, I guess part of what we're providing is sort of like a marketplace that has access to the, lots of other products and services, um, and um, let's say a data subject said that you know they're 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 my customer they said okay i need transport to somewhere and there are a number of transport companies that that they're you know that that could provide that service yes um so i guess so so bottom line is you know as as the data controller i guess i could do some upfront work to vet that third party right Yes, your, respons uh, your responsibility, in fact, your responsibility, have responsibility to, to that, yeah. around that. But I guess ultimately, there's always a risk, you know, that that third party doesn't do um, the right thing with that data, right? So, so the third party is obviously then a data processor, and they yeah. also have to follow the Data Protection Act, the GDPR. Um, you will have a contract with them, a data processing agreement, right? And that data processing agreement will say, "I am the controller. I decide what happens. This is the data I'm sharing. This is what you can do with it." They say, I agree, I'm the data processor, I do nothing that you don't tell me, and you've told me to match this data against taxi companies, right? And to, to make a bid and make an offer, an attracted taxi, and then pass that data back to you so that you can make that offer to your client. I'm making this up, but just imagine, right? Totally legit, right? Using processors to do things, totally normal, right? You just have a data, a data processing agreement with each of them, which specifies that you are the controller, this is the data explicitly shared, and that would include then, what, how can they subprocess? So they can only subprocess to subprocessors that you have agreed to. That's the law. The law says, yes, you can get processors and they must say, and I'm going to use Amazon to store. You go, correct. And they're going to use, I'm going to use this third party in China. You go, no. They go, yeah, well, how can we do that? You go, I'll help create an agreement with the third party in China and so forth. So when we talk about uh, processing, there's one set of agreements. The other one is just to throw into the mix. Uh, transfers and when we say transfers we usually mean transferring outside of the zone right mm -hmm. so in our case the uk but re in reality the eu and that would include new zealand and it would include some other organizations that are considered to be in the same um bubble right uh, again transferring out actually requires the customer's consent so your end user you'd have to say to the end user I, I i do use this chinese company tiktok to 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 store your data are you okay with that they would have to agree to that but you could use a German uh, taxi, amazing transport hookup gadget, totally legitimately, right? Uh, transparency is good, but that's up to you. And, and in, in many cases, you could say, we do use subprocessors. I'm not telling you what they are, but I, I, I assure you that they are all in the EU and they all abide by the GDPR, right? That's allowed. You don't have to, you're allowed to subprocess without being too explicit. A customer can ask you, and of course, transparency is brilliant, right? That's not true if you're going to ship it to, outside of the GDPR bubble, which now includes New Zealand, uh, a few other uh, places, doesn't include Australia, it's quite explicit. And just on that, I guess, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of companies in the health foundry use um, cloud-based services, right? So if, for example, you were using for the sake of argument, salesforce.com as their CRM, yep. and they're based in the US, they are, but what what ha so you so you're allowed to 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 send data to any country, providing that the agreement that you have with that uh, processor is watertight, okay. And so in the case of 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 Salesforce, what they must create with you, and when you sign up, it'll probably say this. It will say something like, "Here are here's what we agree, right?" Uh, and and the Europe has these in Europe they have these things called the standard contractual clauses, right? And those clauses basically say uh you know i i agree not 
to ship the data somewhere that you've not agreed I shipped them to. I've agreed not to do something different other than the things you said. I've agreed that you're the controller for the data. I've agreed these things. Then if in actual fact they do something else, you've got them, right? It's They're then suable because they have breached that contract. So, when, so And this is why I put contracts in for compliance and I put it in as a separate bullet because contracts are going to be a very important part of how you set up. Now, in some cases, you don't get to amend that contract, right? And you know, you don't get to, to, to put feedback in for the for the Salesforce contract or the Microsoft contract or the Google contract or the Amazon contract. But they're all GDPR compliant companies, right? And they say so in their terms and conditions. They say, we are GDPR compliant. You can do things like decide where the data is stored. That's true for Microsoft. It's true for many things now, right? Uh, you can say, I want my data stored in the UK or I want it stored in the EU. Um, and, and Google, for example, is very responsive to this now. They're not a particularly good privacy citizen, but uh, many European schools are now banning the Chromebook and associated technologies because of the Google Analytics. So Google Analytics, which I'm sure you're all thinking of using, is a transfer of some data to America where, unfortunately, that data cannot be prevented from being accessed by the government. Do I think that's a thing? Well, it's just a thing, right? It is or it isn't, right? So the, Google's now responding and saying, fine, we will, we will now create a, 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 a EU uh, Google Analytics backend. So the data is never in America and thus cannot be accessed by American authorities without your say so. So uh, it, it's on you as the data controller to go and see if Salesforce has the documentation you're looking for, right? Uh, has GDPR statements, right, that are part of the terms and conditions that you have signed up for. You won't have a lot of variation in that, um, but I'm confident that they have produced um, something satisfactory from an EU perspective because they're a widely used platform. Thank you. The, the big SaaS are great in the sense that they know this <laughs> and they have strategies. They would like the largest European companies to be using Salesforce. And therefore, the companies that will have uh, the most number of issues. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Any other questions? Sandra, you've come off mute, suggesting you might be leaping in with a question. But, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Weirdly, okay, you... great. Okay, the headsets don't really work then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a quick question on um, consent, particularly around informal consent and what that would look like. Um, so I asked this question because, um, so currently working with a healthcare provider on a small pilot study, and we've got a bunch of patients, we've taken sort of like the formal consent already. But because we've got sort of follow on activities that we're doing with the patients around focus groups and um, surveys and stuff, at that point, we're sort of taking informal content, which is essentially verbal. So I wanted to understand, you know, how if, if that is allowed, what is permissible around uh, consenting? Well, the, tr the trouble is there's no record. Right. So so that, that yeah, in theory, yes. Right. Um, I mean, perhaps if it was on video, right? Uh, but but essentially, that that is the problem is that is that what in, again in the event of a breach, and the ICO is interested because you seem to have done something odd, they will ask you to demonstrate that if consent is your legal basis, how you know you have it, right? And so what is expected is that in a database somewhere, you have that con date of consent, how you achieved the consent through a click, and what were the what was the privacy statement or other um, documentation that you shared with the the data subject at the time they consented? Yeah. So quite a lot in there, a version controlled privacy statement, right? Um, you know, people change privacy statements all the time. What what did they click on? You could say, look, it says in our privacy statement that we do share data with X, Y, Z. The person goes, yeah, not when I clicked, right? Not it, when I clicked, you said you don't. Uh, so, so, Again, a, a, an investigation might look at to say, well, show me the versions of the privacy statement. So just from this language, you can see that it would be hard to imagine how a verbal um, consent would be recorded, yeah. right? Uh, what documentation, what date, what time? Um, and so I, I don't, <laughs> I've never heard of it before in the sense that, and, and I don't think there's anything explicit, right? It's just that 
it just wouldn't it wouldn't meet the criteria of date, timestamp, place, and what did they consent to being mm-hmm. recorded in a way that could be replayed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So some kind of a card. I mean, so it, it doesn't have to be electronic again potentially. Um, so perhaps some kind of a a, a card or a brochure um, that they could sign. And yeah, then later, on, think... later on, you could data enter that and say, you know, or photocopy it, push, put it in as an image. There, there, you could you could think about a, a non-digital version, but equally they could just put their email address in and some press or. Yeah. Yes, no, get, getting getting the record will be your challenge. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So I've left my email address there. It's also John at Smart DPO. Um, as Foundry members, right, you are entitled to approach me at any time, right? I am very rarely in the Foundry these days, but then I find neither the people that I'm mostly talking to. Um, you can come and find me at any time, right, as part of that agreement. And in fact, I have way more people from the Foundry who talk to me than have had ever been my customer. <laughs> but I do offer also data protection services uh, on a on a what's the, probably the most flexible basis in the market because I recognize, especially startups, you don't have a lot of money, you're pre-funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I have, you can just email me and I will advise you, right? And that's just how it is. It's not a legal contract. Uh, it's just advice. If at any point you want to bring me in for one-offs, you can. So for example, if you wanted to run a risk management workshop with your team, you can do that in person or on the thing. Um, you can take me on as a data protection officer. It's a basic, it's 99.99, okay? It's a hundred pound an hour, right? And so it's easy to budget. So you can say, right, do I need, what's the minimum? An hour a month, I have plenty of customers on that, right? On a quid a month, right? That's a registered data protection officer. We register that with the ICO. And now they have a person that they can come to and say, I've had a complaint. And the role of the data protection officer is to handle that, right? To come back to you and say, uh, is that process still operating and that kind of thing? So it's a, usually there'd be a few few more hours than that to get going, but in the end, that's what it can come down to. And that um, is, is your bare minimum, <laughs> two hours a month, some of that, right? Uh, but we're not there. And and I have three more of these workshops that you, you're you very welcome to come along uh, in the next couple of months, uh, but you can always tap me up anytime right now. And if I think it's work, find like an invoice you just a one off you know we can do we can do a few hours work and we could just i can just invoice you for that and at some point you can say well i need a date protection officer um, as i said you've got the market um i think they're quite expensive i think the market's full of people who'd like to charge you a day a month and a seven day startup <laughs> um and so the way i'm pitching at the moment is i'm aiming at very small businesses especially startups they got no money and so therefore flexibly approach uh, but as i say as members of the foundry just email me if you have a question even five minutes from now <laughs> but what about that's not a problem just fire them in and then uh, we'll, you know we can take it from there and if it escalates into something else great and if it doesn't we've answered your question and that's fine at some point right i'm going to be open sourcing right a set of policies on github whatever uh to try it because again like people are charging for this and honestly seriously stop right i mean you go to chat GPT now and get a lot of this stuff. Um, so it's really about the, the gaps. It's assurance. How do I know as a small business is that I've done enough, right? The ICO has a great checklist. You can go there and follow it. I recommend you do. You do not have to come to your data protection officer for that. Uh, but at some point, if you're processing data and that data is real, you need to have a registered DPO and I'm just the cheapest way you can do that and the most flexible way you can do that. Uh, but for now, thank you for coming along. Um, uh, I see some of you signed up for the next one. Look forward to it. Uh, but as I say, anything that burns in the min- in the middle of the month, just fire off an email. We'll take it from there.